invited to come and speak a little bit about interculturality in lesson design and have learned a little bit about the Cultura model. And as you've seen, it really has some fascinating aspects. And there are pieces of what I'm going to talk about that are similar and pieces that are different. And we also, and that's okay, because as teachers, we are going to look at all of the tools and approaches that are available to us, and we're going to choose the tools that best meet the needs of all of our students at any given time. And what meets the needs of our students may in fact change um, from moment to moment or from class to class. So I'll be sharing a couple of things, um, ending with a specific example. And one of the things I actually ended up looking at just for my own benefit was uh, what the National Council of State Supervisors of Foreign Language says about interculturality. And I found it really interesting that a lot of what they say really is parallel to what the goals of the Cultura project are, for example, as well as the work in my own classes. Um, they, they talk about interculturality being a dynamic process and that it's active participation and communication, but not just for language, but communication that's guided by a knowledge and an understanding of culture. And that in order for that to happen, and in order for students to eventually demonstrate intercultural competence, they have to both be able to use the language and then to behave appropriately in a variety of intercultural contexts. There's one key thing that I think could be added to this definition, if you will, and that is the sense that these kinds of dynamic, active, and guided exchanges have to be ongoing. There has to be this sense of a connection that we are making to peoples around the world and within our communities who speak these languages, um, that it's not just once a year or not until they get to the fourth year that they have these opportunities. And for me personally, and as Stephen said, this is going to be more a little bit about what I've been doing to try to build interculturality in my students from my setting in California. Um, one of the shifts I've started to make is trying to find ways to keep culture at the core of my instruction, and it is definitely a work in progress. So some of the things that have helped me do this and advice that I would pass on to other instructors is to start simple by reframing what we look at as basic vocabulary lessons through more of a cultural lens. For example, we learn about food in almost every language you know, class that is taught. We have a, a moment at time in which we talk about food. But in fact, we can also make that much more of a cultural engagement so that they're learning about food with a cultural perspective behind it by looking at meals in different uh, target language countries and using that as the impetus for which foods the students will learn about. I'm not necessarily going to show all of the things I had intended to show today. I'm going to try to build back in a little bit more time for um, the presenter and for Stephen after me as well. But this is in French also, so my apologies. But one of the things I started to introduce my students' exploration of food and nutrition was looking at foods from around the world. And we used that as part of how we learned what food items are and which foods we'll be able to say. And so we did. We did some foods from Morocco, from Canada, um, from France, as opposed to the typical food list you might normally present with your students that is relatively devoid of culture with perhaps a couple of cultural food items thrown in. We also then look at nutrition as a cultural perspective because as it turns out, and this was actually even a surprise to me, Every country has nutritional guidelines that they publish for their population. What makes a balanced meal? And as it turns out, the ideal balanced diet does not look the same around the world because, of course, everything that we do and every interaction that we have is colored and guided by our own cultural perspectives. And even something that seems as so straightforward as nutrition and a balanced diet still has a cultural perspective and lens behind it. So we actually study in my classes um, cultural, the Guide Alimentaire, uh, the food guidelines. So this is just my drive, but I have food guidelines from different countries um, showing what they see as the base of their food. If they use a pyramid, what should be the biggest portion of their food for the day and even what elements are included there. Things like eggs are in different parts of the py pyramid. Bananas and fruits in the same family as bananas are in different parts of the pyramid. One pyramid actually has sugar listed as one of the main foods for the day, and there's a reason for that, and it's a very important reason culturally for the people in that country and the reality of their life. But it does help open my students' eyes to 
it gives them a window into another country's and another culture's perspectives and their lives. So you can learn not just places in town, but towns as a cultural concept. The layout, the way streets and buildings are named all reflect the culture. We can do school subjects or we can do a comparison of educational systems looking at the classes in terms of what grade levels look like in different country and how students are divided into classes, their schedules, how grades are determined and communicated. And in doing all of these things, we're still going to learn words and we're still going to learn structures that help us communicate, but we're going to start refocusing the way we learn so that there's a cultural lens. Now that was just one, that was just a quick overview of some things I start doing even at the novice levels, my year ones, for example, and I do teach at a high school. And I was talking to Stephen um, when we were preparing for this and I was telling him about how my class is currently pen pals with a school in France. They're also working with a high school director in Togo on another project, but right now they're, they're pen pals with a high school in France and some of the work we're doing actually had some really interesting parallels to Cultura. One of the things that ended up happening though was the teacher in France and myself, we chose a collaborative project, something that we thought would be relevant to both sets of our students. And both classes are actually working on an anti-food waste campaign for their pen pal schools. Now, as you look at that, you're going to realize right away the end product is definitely not along the culture of model because in that case they're going to be working on the campaign with the intention of it being used by the other school. And we were very purposeful in that. We wanted our students to have to try to write for an audience of target language speakers in a way that would be reflective of their understanding of the culture and what would appeal to the speakers and draw the speakers into the various components of their campaign and be comprehensible. So we've been sending media to each other. We've created and exchanged surveys and you'll see in a minute that the languages did vary. So that piece is a lot like Cultura. There are points where we were answering things in English and they are answering things in French so that they can actually freely share ideas and opinions in their native language without being constrained by trying to do so in their new language. Um, creating logos and slogans and then seeking feedback from each other. So I'm going to show you some of these examples. Um, the students' responses to their pen pal surveys and the students' responses to each other's work has been providing insight into each group's cultural perspectives. And it actually ended up being some unintended project-based language learning. I hadn't originally designed this using the templates and models for project-based language learning, but it's working itself kind of organically into a project-based learning because we're actually going to be doing um, this work not just for learning about food waste, not just for passing some kind of test, but actually trying to make a difference in both of our communities and in each other's communities. So I'm going to show you some of the work. So Originally, my student, for example, my students created a survey um, of very short questions in French, but all the questions were open-ended. And what happened was the doggy bag is a very common concept in the U.S. We go to restaurants, we pay for our food, we don't finish it, we ask for a doggy bag, we take our food home that we did not finish. There are a variety of reasons for which this has really not been a popular idea in France. Um, there are some cultural reasons why it's not considered um, appropriate to do that. There are also concerns about whether or not the restaurant owners are concerned about whether or not it would be even be healthy to allow consumers to take the food away from the restaurant and potentially leave it in their car for too long, for example. So my stu there was an article that came out because France just published a law saying restaurants have to start offering doggy bags. France is really, really working on reducing food waste and they really want restaurants to start offering doggy bags. So they actually passed a law and said that they're going to have to. So we actually sent our pen pals a survey on that topic and although my students created the questions in French, the students answered in their native language. We just got the results back yesterday. So I just took some pictures. Um, but you can see like the student in the center, like she wrote several sentences and she was free to express herself in her own language. And my students, as Sabine explained, will have the benefit of picking up additional vocabulary and nuances and means of expression from reading how it is that the students answer to these questions and there are some really nice like language gems inside these responses that I'm looking forward to my students seeing. We also did a survey in English that is for our students at my high school to complete, not just our class, so it's in our native language. 
my class designed the questions. We distributed it via QR codes, but it just got distributed, so we don't have very many results yet. And the results will be in English as well um, from a number of speakers. So those results will be sent off um, to France when the survey is done. And um, there are some that are, um, oops, excuse me. There are some that are open-ended and some that are more statistical in nature that they will be able to take a look at. So we're doing a kind of blended model of some of our work is in our target language and some of our work is in our native language. The French students just sent us um, posters that they're thinking they might like to have us put up at our school um, in an anti-food waste campaign. And so they worked in English. That is their target language. So it's not the language in which they're comfortable. So our students will provide feedback in English to them and they're working on that for homework this week and their feedback is due on Friday. So the students in this case, again, unlike Cultura, are attempting to communicate in a way that they think will be receptive, well received by an American audience. And so these are the different posters that have been sent to us and my students are going to give feedback on the design and impact, but also on word choice and on um, language usage and so on, ways to, that will help the students um, be able to make their posters even more powerful. Um, and then my class didn't start with posters right away. I actually had my class back up a bit and start with designing a logo and a slogan for their campaign that they would like to design for the school in France. And I did not edit it. I let them design. They posted their ideas on a interactive online bulletin board called dot storming. And on a dot storming board, you can contribute ideas, which basically means text. You can type or you can contribute photos. But what's really neat about it is that then when you send the link off to other people, they can comment on the contributions and they can vote for their favorites. This may take, it does take a little bit to load sometimes. So um, I should have clicked on that right when I started speaking actually, <laughs> knowing that it does take a little bit to load. I'm gonna let that load for a second. And so what happens was my students tried to do a slogan, which I liked as a language concept because it's very short, it's very doable, it's very approachable. Um, and they tried to design also a logo. And so the students in France received those and in their native languages, um, well, actually I think the teacher asked them to do it in English this time. Some might have done it in their native language. Um, they had the option. We did not ask, we did not specify what language to give feedback in, but it is possible that their teacher insisted that they practice in English. Um, and it's still loading. So we'll come back to that if it finishes. It does take a little bit to load because it's graphically a little bit intense. And so what about the mistakes? Because unlike Cultura, my students are working in both languages and our pen pals teacher, their students, their, her students are working in both languages. So mistakes are evident and they do happen when the students create work in their new language. Um, the feedback provided by the other class in the native language is really helpful and some of it is linguistic, but others of it is more culturally nuanced. Um, we had some interesting responses because my you know, students tried to represent things that turned out to be idiomatic um, in their native languages and of course it's very difficult to make those kinds of changes. But both chances get the chance to be the expert and write freely and deeply in their native language for some of our tasks. They also get the chance to try to meaningfully create products in their target language for an authentic purpose and audience. And we're really focusing on that aspect of collaboration with us helping the school in France make the best possible product for an American audience and them helping my students create the best possible products for a French speaking audience. So we have a kind of blended model where both kinds of things are happening um, and where students are have a role where they can really freely write and express themselves and um, provide some of that kind of deeper feedback and other times where they're working on developing their language. Yeah, it's going to be persnickety and not open. So fortunately you have, I believe you'll have access um, to these presentations or they'll ask us later to share them with you and you'll be able to try to take a look at it later. Um, so. One of the other things I wanted to mention that I didn't um, hone in on before and didn't mention, uh, Sabine actually had talked about the um, aspect of the photos. And photos are a really incredible way to start getting a window into culture because as she showed, ask students to take a picture of the same thing in two different countries. 
industries and you get a completely different response based on how they see that object or that aspect of their life. And I had some pretty good luck designing a similar project that I used to call Through Their Eyes. And it really was just that. It was students trying to reveal American culture and values by using pictures to show their pen pals their life through their own eyes. And our pen pals would do the same thing. Um, we've done it with classes in France, and we even did it with a village in Africa, which was very interesting because there were some differences there. Um, so the key is to go, we really want to help our students go beyond just being, being culturally aware in our society now, it's no longer enough to be aware of other cultures or aware that there are other values. We really want to help our students go beyond being culturally aware to use language with purpose and to make connections with meaning. And that meaning is guided by constantly having a lens that focuses our classes on the bigger picture behind the words, the culture, the perspectives, and the practices that really drive the way people communicate and the reasons that the interactions occur the way they do um, when native speakers of the language speak to each other. So I think, oh, I, I barely did it. Um, sorry, I meant to try to go even faster, so I'm going to stop there so that Stephen has time to present something as well. And thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, and all right. so. Um, uh, as a sort of discussant, I will note that uh, there were points of similarity and points of difference in uh, what Nicole is describing and what uh, Sabine called classic cultura. And some of that centers around the use of L1 and L2 by the students as they work. Uh, and I think, you know, there will be a lot more conversation about this as we go forward. Uh, it It is uh, very illuminating to learn how classic cultura works, uh, but it's also okay to consider ways in which you might adapt the cultura model uh, to you, you know your specific circumstances to meet needs. But uh, I think it's helpful. I think all of us probably now are realizing that, if you conduct an online exchange or a pen pal kind of thing, and you ask the students to use their own first language in that stage, then the language that appears can be used as input for learning uh, you know, by your students, by both sides, because both languages are there. And that once you have that input, then you can do the language work with it, and you'll, you'll be getting you'll be uh, moving from re uh, sort of an input phase where you're getting that language from the exchange and moving towards an output phase where you try to articulate, summarize what happened. And for that, of course, the students would be using the target language. Uh, I'd like to share uh, uh, with uh, Nicole a question from Dali Tan uh, asking about assessment. Can you talk a little bit about how and what you're assessing in your project? Um, that depends on the phases. So one of the interesting things about the work we're doing on this project is a lot of it is language, I guess I would say more language practice. Um, and ultimately, it's leading them to the point where they will have a, some final products, which will be the actual artifacts and items from their anti-food waste campaign excuse me, campaign, I anticipate that my students will, like the French students just did, possibly create posters, possibly create online media, or even do a social media campaign or a blend of those. And the kinds of things that they ultimately decide to use as the final published products that they want their French audience to see are the things that I will be assessing as a presentational writing grade and or presentational speaking if they choose to make any videos such as a public service announcement that they hope that their classes will see. Um, in the meantime, in my classes, I do standards-based grading, and so all of the formative work and the prep work and the practice work leading up gets feedback, but it doesn't actually have points in the grade, so to speak. That's not something we can really discuss here at this time, but I hope it gives you kind of some sense of of where we're at. So right now they're just in the design phase and they're getting feedback along the way, but there isn't a grade until they actually have a product that they intend for an audience to actually see and work with. 
Great, thank you for that answer. Uh, let's see, um, there's a question from Ludmila. How do you select topics for intercultural discussions? Do you have any specific recommendations? Um, actually, I was just writing a, a chat uh, to that effect. So because you mentioned the pen pal thing, and one of the things I didn't mention was, as far as our traditional letters, if you will, the actual pen paling that we do off and on throughout the year, some of the letters are entirely in English. Some are entirely in French for both sides. Some are a blend, and when I'm looking for a blend, it could be a variety of things. It could be, for example, or even all in English or all in French, sometimes current events on one side of the aisle or the other influence or provide a topic, and we might write about that. And usually when we do so, we're going to write about that in our native language because it's, it's not necessarily something that we've been learning about and practicing and that they are, my students are prepared to express their feelings about. And Often what I'll do is I'll, my, the teacher and I will talk, talk about what our various students are learning to do right now in the new link, in their new language, and, and so we'll design a couple of letter topics where they are going to write in their target language about the topics that they're learning how to use already in class. For example, um, if, if they're learning to, as something as simple as if they're learning to talk about the past, you could do this with a lower level class than the one I'm working on right now.